Who doesn't like to get in a little bit of trouble? Not the kind of trouble where anyone gets hurt, not the kind of trouble with any lasting consequences, just a little mostly harmless fun. The sort of mostly harmless fun that may or may not get you side-eye from a local patrolman and concerned suburban parents who have lost their sense of wonder when they bought their first lawnmower. Mischief Night is a celebration that takes place the night before Halloween. Young children, high school students, and adults who haven't quite given up the ghost stalk the streets of their neighborhoods with pranks in hand. Tomorrow is trick-or-treat, but tonight is exclusively about tricks. There is no candy, and there are no rewards, except for mayhem. The thrill of performing mischief without anyone really getting hurt, and the joy of getting away with it. Mischief Night operates on a form of situational ethics. Under ordinary circumstances, roaming the neighborhood and mildly vandalizing private property is considered, at best, bad form, and at worst, criminal. The situational ethics of Mischief Night absolve the perpetrators of said vandalism as a communal agreement. Put more simply, Mischief Night is a PG-rated purge movie. This is the night in which we have collectively agreed that there will be some mischief devoid of significant legal consequences so long as the mischief itself is similarly insignificant. Mischief Night serves the overall function of folklore, maintaining the stability and continuity of a group within a larger culture. As explained by James Deutsch of the Smithsonian Institute, in 1954, the folklorist William Bascom authored an influential article on the four functions of folklore, which apply fully to the traditions of Mischief Night. A first function is simply amusement. The second function is education. If we were fortunate, we might learn something on Mischief Night about ourselves as we underwent the transition from childhood to adulthood. And the third function is validation and reinforcement of beliefs and conduct. By sharing in the activities of Mischief Night, we helped to maintain the traditions of our folk group, which are passed from one cohort to the next. The final and fourth function is to provide socially sanctioned and approved outlets for expressing minor aggressions, tensions, cultural taboos, and fantasies. I'm calling this glorious holiday Mischief Night, but in truth it has no uniformly accepted name. In New Jersey and much of the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States, it's Mischief Night, but in the Midwest it's sometimes called Devil's Night. It varies wildly, but here are some of my favorite variations. Moving Night, Cabbage Night, Mat Night, Gate Night, Hell Night, Damage Night, Soap Night, and my personal favorite, Goosey Night. In the United Kingdom, Mischief Night is also called Mischievous Night, which is sometimes shortened to Chievous Night, Mickey Night, Mizzy Night, or Miggy Night. It's also called Tic Tac Night, Trick Night, and Corn Night. These variations all have one thing in common, the expectation of mischief being performed under the cover of darkness. It's not called Goosey Day, it's Goosey Night. The different names also inform people what is expected of them and the traditions of that region. Pranksters armed with kernels of corn inspired the name Corn Night. Pranksters carrying cabbages coined the term Cabbage Night. Soap Night comes from defacing windows with soap. Moving Night is common in Baltimore because the local prank involves taking lawn ornaments, furniture, and trash cans from one house and placing them on the lawns of another house. Devil's Night is most common in the Detroit area due to past instances becoming especially catastrophic, so much that it was referenced in the 1990s action movie The Crow. Some activities on Mischief Night are more universal than throwing cabbages and corn. The most common is toilet papering a house, tree, mailbox, or anything that can be wrapped up. Other pranks include ringing doorbells, throwing eggs, and smashing jack-o'-lanterns. A few of these activities are also performed on Halloween itself, but real trick-or-treaters know that getting all of that mayhem out of your system on the 30th leaves more time for amassing candy and going to parties on the 31st. Plus, if you get detained by the police on Halloween, you can forget about your plans that evening, but if you do it on mischief night, you might be out in time for trick-or-treating. If you get arrested on Halloween, you can just forget about your plans that evening, forcing you to wait an entire year before you get another chance. After all, you only get so many childhood Halloweens, so Mischief Night becomes necessary. So how did Mischief Night even get started? Some people are under the mistaken impression that smashing pumpkins and toilet papering houses the night before Halloween had its origins as far back as 1790, but that Mischief Night was something else altogether. Let's provide some context. 
According to Time magazine, the oldest uses of the term mischief knight were in Britain, not the US, with the first known instance at Oxford in 1790. However, that mentioned, like later 19th century usages in books and newspapers, doesn't mean October 30th. Instead, that mischief night was the day before May Day, when young people played practical jokes such as switching shop signs, overturning water tubs, and trapping people inside their houses. Other British mentions of mischief night may refer to November 4th, the eve of Guy Fawkes Day. Mischief Night as we know it began in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s, possibly connected to the Great Depression and the start of World War II. Black Tuesday happened right before Halloween on October 29, 1929. Historians speculate that this encouraged the vandalism and petty crimes connected to what is now Mischief Night. People needed to have their fun somehow. This, combined with the threat of a looming world war, changed the national personality just enough for this to be the new hotness of the 1930s and beyond. Armed with this knowledge, you should not feel too many moral pangs about performing a little mischief on October 30th. Let's wrap things up with a little advice on what to do and what not to do on mischief night. Egging a house. Let's talk about it. Children throw eggs at houses and cars on mischief night because these little guys are corrosive to paint. Egg yolks are acidic. It's also easy to get your hands on some, they're at every grocery store. If you're planning on throwing eggs, two pieces of advice. First, mischief night is supposed to be fun, not a night to cause lasting damage. Throw your eggs at surfaces that do not corrode. Corrosion-resistant metals include copper, brass, bronze, precious metals like platinum, gold, and silver. You don't need to cause real property damage to have a good time, and you don't want the police to make you or your family pay for damages. However, if the property is some mansion owned by some rich guy, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Second, don't wait until mischief night to buy your eggs. Some grocery stores and convenience stores will not sell eggs to children of trick-or-treating age around the end of the month of October. A week before mischief night will draw less suspicion. Next, toilet papering a tree or a house. Roll out a length of toilet paper throw it above where you want it to land, remove the length of toilet paper from the roll itself, and repeat the process until you are satisfied with the results. As for smashing jack-o'-lanterns, I do not recommend this. I'm sorry if this makes me sound too sensitive, but parents and their children carve pumpkins together, and why would you want to make a child cry on Halloween? Your pranks should inconvenience adults, not ruin a kid's favorite holiday. To sum up, Choose your targets and activities appropriately. This is not a night for arson. It's a night for fun.